Hi chemists, welcome back. You chose to watch this video as part of our mathematics and chemistry unit on significant figures. By the end of this video, you should be able to perform measurements with the proper degree of uncertainty, identify how many significant figures there are in a number, and round to the appropriate amount of significant figures in calculations. Whenever we make measurements, there's always going to be a certain degree of uncertainty. And the reason why is because we have to read every digit that we can off of the measuring device, and then we always have to estimate one more digit. So for example, this is a graduated cylinder. And upon reading this, we would definitely say the unit for the graduated cylinder would be milliliters. However, when we're reading this, I think from person to person, we would all agree that it's definitely 56 something milliliters. And so we are reading every digit that we can off of this device. And then according to our rules, we have to estimate one more. So upon looking at this, again, we said this is all split up into ones. So since the bottom of the meniscus is right at 56, that's where the 56 comes from. But as I mentioned, we need to estimate one more. So that's why we would have to estimate to the tenths place. So in this case, we would say it would be 56.0. Now you may say, Miss Rez, I think that it's 56.1 milliliters, and that would be absolutely fine. That estimated digit will vary from person to person. Even if you said, Miss Rez, it's going to be 56.9, technically it's an estimated digit, although I would say you probably need to work on your estimation skills. But every time you're working in the laboratory, anytime you have to make a measurement, you are going to read every digit that you can off of the device and then estimate one more. Now, the amount of definite digits depends on the device that you have or the precision of the device that you have. So an exact number is a number that has absolutely no uncertainty. Therefore, it has an infinite number of significant figures. So anytime you're counting something, that's usually considered an exact number, and that's why you're going to expect it to have an infinite number of sig figs, and there will be no rounding going on. Defined quantities are also considered to be exact. So for example, we know that 12 inches equal a foot and 100 centimeters equals one meter. These are all examples of exact numbers. So here are some rules for identifying the number of sig figs that you have in a particular number. This rule is pretty easy. All non-zero digits are significant. So in the example 2.17, nothing's a zero, so therefore there's three sig figs. 3894.6, every single one of those numbers is not zero, that's five sig figs. Here's where we get into the zeros. So leading zeros are never significant. And so when we think about the word leading, hopefully you're thinking about in front. So for example, if you have 0 0.003, there's only one sig fig there. The zeros in front are merely placeholders. 0 0.04, again, there's only one sig fig. Captive zeros are always significant. So captive, you can think of zeros in between non-zero numbers. They're always in the middle. So in this case, 205, every single one of those would be significant. Or 20,005, every single one of those would be significant. And then the last scenario is a trailing zero. So as it sounds, right, these are zeros at the end. So these zeros are sometimes significant. So the first scenario is they are significant if the number contains a decimal point. Let me show you what I mean. So if you have 155.0, since there is a decimal point, since that zero comes at the end, that zero is considered significant. And so every single one of those digits is significant. 0 0.450. Again, there is a decimal point there, and that zero at the end is trailing. Therefore, every single one of those is considered significant. However, the zero in front is technically a leading zero, and that's why it is not significant. Here's the second scenario. They are not significant if the number does not contain a decimal point. So, for example, 1550. Since there is not a decimal point at the end, only the one, the five, and the five are considered significant. And then in the number 45,000, again, those are all trailing zeros. There is no decimal point, 
So therefore, there are only two significant figures. So let's do a really helpful summary. Again, zero that come before the non-zero numbers, these are leading zeros and they're never significant. In the middle between two non-zero numbers, those are called captive zeros and they are always significant. And then the zeros at the end are called trailing zeros and they are sometimes significant. If there's a decimal point, then they're significant. So I always just remember never, always, sometimes. So you try it. You can feel free to pause this video or you can kind of work along with me for the first couple and then why don't you try some on your own. So in the first example, you gotta think about what rule is this going to be corresponding to. So notice there are no zeros in this number. So guess what? All three are significant. In the second example, we do have some zeros now. So we actually have trailing zeros and we said these are sometimes significant. They're significant only if there's a decimal point. Well, guess what? There is a decimal point and they're trailing, so these will also be three sig figs. We've got a couple, we've got two sets of zeros here. It looks like we've got two here and then one here. So for these, these are actually captive zeros because they're between non-zero numbers. So you can see these are captive and these are captive. Remember, these are always significant. So every single one of those numbers is going to be a sig fig. Again, we've got two sets of zeros here. These are leading zeros, which remember we said are never significant. This zero at the end is a trailing zero, which we said is sometimes significant. So we already know that these zeros in front do not count. But this one, it's a trailing zero. And we said if there is a decimal point, which guess what? There is, then that zero is considered significant. So in this example, the five and the zero would make for two sig figs. These zeros are also trailing zeros. Notice there is no decimal point. So because there's no decimal point, those zeros are not significant, they're merely placeholders, and there's only two sig figs. And then what's really nice about scientific notation is that whatever the coefficient is, that's exactly how many sig figs you have. So the fact that there are three written here, guess what? Three is gonna be the number of sig figs. So that's how you identify how many sig figs there are in a number. Now we have to use this information to perform calculations because scientists, right, besides making measurements, they, oft, they often have to manipulate those measurements as well by doing calculations. So we have two rules. The first one is addition and subtraction. The good news is, is they follow the same rule. So the first thing that I always tell my students for addition and subtraction is look at the decimal places. That's what you're gonna focus on when you're doing these calculations. So your answer is going to be rounded to the same number of decimal places as the number used in the calculation with the least decimal places. So let me show you what I mean. So we've got these two calculations and what I would do is just simply, you know, write out the answers for each of these. And so that's what I did here. So I know obviously how to plug these things in my calculator. You could do kind of a quick calculation by hand if you wanted to. So these are the answers that we get. Now I did highlight in blue where we're gonna see the sig figs. So again, we said that we have to focus on the decimal places for addition and subtraction. So this has one decimal place to the right and this has two. And that's why I highlighted the seven because the seven has the least number of decimal places. So therefore your answer has to have the same number of decimal places as the one with the least number of decimal places. So in this case, it's 7.81, your answer will only have one decimal place to the right as a result. As far as rounding is concerned, notice that there is a one next to the eight. Typically the rule of thumb, if it's um, five, then you round up. If it's four or below, then you kind of just chop it off and get rid of it. So since this is a one, we just chop it off and get rid of it. And then I wrote 7.8. Uh, 7 I did include my unit of meters because remember these are supposed to represent measurements. Let's try the second one. So notice, again, we're concerned with decimal places. Your answer has to have the least number of decimal places as the one that has the smallest amount. So in this case, we've got two decimal places. Here we've got three. That means that our answer should only have two decimal places and that's why I highlighted these sevens in blue. As I mentioned, there is a five next to this seven. So with rounding, that means that this five is going to have to round the seven to an eight. So you should end up with 5.78 grams. So I did two examples. 
why don't you try these? So again, we have subtraction. And whenever we're looking at subtraction, we're looking at decimal places. So there's two decimal places to the right. Here there are three. That means our answer can only have two decimal places to the right. So when you round this appropriately, you should get 3.77. Take a look at this one. You have one decimal place to the right versus two. Our answer can only have one. Same thing with this one, two decimal places to the right versus one, our answer can only have one. Just be careful here with the rounding though, this five is gonna round the four so that you end up with 98.5 milliliters. Again, notice I'm including all my units as I go through and do these calculations. And then last but not least, we have some addition here with three numbers. Again, not a big deal, handle it the same way. You've got two decimal places, one decimal place, and three decimal places. Our answer can only have one decimal place to the right. Beautiful. So that's how you do addition and subtraction calculations with sig figs. Are you ready for multiplication and division? I am. So for multiplication and division, instead of focusing on decimal places, we're actually focusing on the entire number. So you're going to look at the total number of sig figs. And this is why you can see why it was important to be able to teach you how to identify the number of sig figs first. So when you're doing um, multiplication and division, your answer is rounded to the same number of sig figs as the number used in the calculation with the least sig figs. Notice we're not talking about decimal places here. So here's some more examples, right? Just like we talked about before, I would write out all my answers. So we've got these two numbers that we're dividing, and we've got these two numbers that we're multiplying. So I just typed these into my calculator and I just wrote the answers down. But let's follow the rules for multiplication and division. We said that our answer can only have the least number of significant figures based off of the numbers that have the least. So for example, this has a total of four sig figs. This has a total of three. Therefore, my answer can only have three total. So this should be 8.38 because there's a zero to the right. Let's try this one. Again, we're multiplying here. Now be careful here. There's leading zeros. Remember, they're never significant. So 5.61 has three sig figs. And then this one has leading zeros, which are never significant, but uh oh, it's also got a trailing. But you know that's no problem for you because you know that if there's a decimal point, then that trailing zero is significant. So therefore, this number has two sig figs. That means our answer can only have two. And so therefore, it'll look something like that. Notice that this is multiplication. So whenever you take a, a unit times a unit, that unit is going to be squared, just similar to algebra class, like if this was like x, so x times x is x squared. Okay, let's try some more examples here. Hopefully you got your calculator handy. So in this calculation, we're taking 4 centimeters times 2.3 centimeters. Again, I just perform the calculation as is, and I just plug it in my calculator and then I write the whole number down. Now notice, this has one sig fig and this has two. Therefore, my answer can only have one. For this one, we've got two sig figs here and three here. Our answer can therefore only have two. And for this one, we're multiplying. So these are leading zeros. So remember, leading zeros are never significant. So there's only two sig figs here and there's three here. So then, our, therefore, our answer can only have two. And again, we've got those, right? It's like x times x, so that's why it's in the later squared. And then finally, we've got three things we're multiplying here. So this has three sig figs, this has four, and this guy, remember that's a leading zero, has two. So therefore, our answer can only have two sig figs, and it should be 0.54 centimeters cubed. So hopefully that helps you. There's only one other thing that you might need to worry about. Sometimes you have to combine these calculations. So my question to you is, well, what happens when you have more than one type of rule going on in a calculation? Well, don't worry, it's not too bad, watch this. So here's an example. What you wanna do is make sure that you don't round at every step. So you can incorporate some rounding error. So what you wanna do is basically perform these calculations in your calculator. Try to keep these numbers in your calculator and then you round at the end. So for example, according to order of operations, I would do whatever's in parentheses first. So I would do the subtraction. And when you do the subtraction, that's the number that you get. 
And notice what I did was I highlighted in red how many sig figs I should have. And the reason why I did this is because we've got subtraction here. Notice the when we're looking at subtraction, we're looking at decimal places. The number 320 has no decimal places and the number 22.7 has one. Therefore, since really our sig figs are based off of the 320, this number should have no decimal places. But again, I don't want to introduce rounding error, so that's why I am not dropping this 0.3. I want to keep that in there. But technically, I'm only going to have three sig figs based on this calculation alone. But notice I have to multiply that by 3.8. So when I multiply that by 3.8, I'm going to end up with 1129.74. Now, with multiplication, 3.8 only has two sig figs. So you're taking a number that technically is supposed to have three times a number that's technically supposed to have two. Well, based off of multiplication and division rules, our answer should therefore only have two. And so that's why our answer would be 1100. So as with all things in chemistry, as I'm sure you're learning, these calculations take practice. Don't worry, you'll get it. And of course, if you're still struggling, there are other choices for you to try on the menu. Thank you so much for watching. I think you did a great job today.